Acts chapter 1, I'll, I will get into this here in just a moment. Now, Pastor Walker t told me I could make myself at home. Is that all right? Amen. I'm going to take this coat off. Is that all right? Amen. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to work this morning. How about that? I want to talk to you here today on the subject of before the upper room. Before the upper room. It's Pentecost Sunday. This is the day that we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit that we read in Acts chapter 2. You know Acts chapter 2. You should. If you don't know it by heart, you've read it, you've heard it preached, you've heard it on Pentecost Sunday. You should, if you're in a Pentecostal church, you should hear about Pentecost. Right. If you're in a church that believes in salvation, somebody should be getting saved. Amen. If you're in a church that believes in deliverance, somebody should be getting delivered. Amen. And so on Pentecost, we know that great chapter, chapter 2, where it tells us they were in one mind and in one accord. And they were together in that upper room. And there came a sound as a mighty rushing wind and it filled the house where they were sitting. And cloven tongues like as a fire sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other languages as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. And then those 120 people that were in the upper room then moved out into the city. And those people that were present at the Feast of Pentecost began to hear the gospel preached to them in their own language. And what was amazing about that is that the people they were hearing it from were people that shouldn't have known their language. That's right. And there, Simon Peter preached the message that convicted thousands of people. Amen. And in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, during the Feast of Pentecost, we have the birth of the New Testament church. Amen. What a day that was. Amen. We would not be here without that day. Amen. Amen. Without the birthing of the New Testament church, we would not be here. Amen. Without those men and women, those 120 that went into the upper room and they waited and they tarried yeah. and they prayed, Somebody say, what does that mean he tarried? What does that mean? That's a word we don't use much anymore. Tarry means you wait. Amen. They tarried. Yes. They waited. We don't know nothing about that now. All right. All right. I was standing the other day. I had uh, uh, something inside the microwave. And uh, my sister was walking through. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm currently tarrying. <laughs> I'm tarrying for these noodles to hurry up. <laughs> Get out of this microwave. And so... They waited there and the Spirit of God came and it was a mighty, massive move. It was the fulfillment of when Simon Peter stepped out and people said, look at what's going on. How all of these people, these people are drunk. And it was on that day that Peter got to declare, these men are not drunk as you suppose. But they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And he told them this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. Amen. What a day. What a day. Huh, we all want some type of upper room experience. Amen. We preach about it. All right. We pray about it. We want our churches to have it. All right. An upper room experience. But I want to talk to you today about before the upper room. Because in Acts chapter 1, we have that great passage of Scripture that's given to us in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6 that says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you getting ready to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? Please remember when this was spoken. Jesus had died on the cross. He had been buried. Now the resurrection had taken place. And so he was alive and well. And he was there with his disciples and he appeared to other people and he was showing himself. I am he that was dead, but now I'm alive. Amen. Now, let's not just pass by that. All right. He was dead All right. Yeah. All right. and now is alive. Amen. Amen. Houdini couldn't do that. All right. Buddha couldn't do that. All right. Confucius didn't do that. Amen. 
David Copperfield, who said he was the greatest magician of all time, could not do that. Amen. He was dead and now alive. Yes. And he's ministering to his disciples. So they are thinking at this point, this man is indestructible. They tried to kill him. They put him on the cross. He died. He's back. He's indestructible. So they ask him this question. They're thinking on the earthly realm. Are you going to restore the kingdom back to us right now? Are you going to overthrow the Romans today? Are you going to establish your kingdom on this earth? Are you going to make yourself emperor supreme now and be the king on this earth? But Jesus goes on and he says to them in verse number seven, he said, it's not for you to know the times or the period that the father has set by his own authority. But here's the verse. You shall receive what? Power. Say it again. Power. One more time. Power. 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 After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Amen. And you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the end of the earth. Now, let me say this very quickly. Everybody, most of the time when they hear that word power, they say, you know what that Greek word is? Dunamis. All right. And I heard a man preach a message one time on dunamis, and he said, it's the dynamite of God. And it all sounded good, except that's not what dunamis means. All right, all right. Dunamis is not where we get the word dynamite from, all right, all right. where it blows up one time and then it's gone. All right, all right. Dunamis means dynamo. It's a constant flow. Oh, you should be happy about that. Yeah, yeah, that you can have the Holy Spirit at midnight on Friday. That you can have the Holy Spirit in your life when you're going through a difficult time. Amen, amen, amen. You know, those times we don't ever talk about in church. You know, when you're going bankrupt and when you're fighting divorce and when you're going through difficulties and your mind is going seven different ways from Sunday. Oh, you don't know anything about that, but some people do. All right, all right. Those of us that didn't come here on our chariot from heaven, right. we drove here on this earth right. dealing with our difficulties. Right. Yeah, I, I know you came on the wings of an angel, but there were two, three demons that were chasing me while I was on my way. Anybody here, anybody know what I'm talking about? So the Holy Spirit's a constant flow, and that's what Jesus said he was sending. He said, you shall receive power after that the spirit has come upon you. Now, pay close attention to the next part. It's very, very important. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That was at home. Notice that the first place the Holy Spirit wants to affect us is at home. Don't come to me talking about all the crusades that you ran all over the world and all the millions of people that you've affected and all of this stuff. If you don't have enough power to affect the people when you walk in your front door, what good is your power? All right. When you step in the front door, if your family doesn't know that you're a man or a woman of God, what good is it? Amen. When you step into the door, somebody should be able to look at you and say, that's a man right there. Amen. That's a man that's following God. Amen. That's a woman that's following God. Yeah. Your children may not fall down at your knees and say, oh, Father, you are so full of the Holy Spirit. They, they may never do that. But they should know that when you look at them and say, son, I'm going to pray for you. They should know something's going to happen. All right. All right. Daughter, I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be praying. When your wife is in pain and you say, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. She should know that you are going to be praying for her and vice versa. So he said, you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem. Then he said, into Judea. So now we're moving outside of our home. We're going into Judea. We're going into outside the home, into the neighborhood, into the other areas. But then notice the next city that he mentions. What is it? Samaria. 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 Samaria and the Jews didn't get along. They called each other dogs. They called each other half-breeds. They looked at one another and said, no, 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 we, we can't sit with you. So he said, the Holy Spirit will be present with you even when you are in the presence of your enemy. 
When your enemy says you're never going to make it, you have the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. When your enemy is waiting for you to fail, you have the Holy yeah. Spirit. When somebody said, I don't have a cheering squad on my side, you have the best cheering squad ever. It came from heaven. You shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But now I want you to notice this next verse because this is very important. Because all of us want an upper room experience. All of us want that moment to be alone and have a sound as a rushing mighty wind. To have something, an encounter with God that is so real that you know, that you know, that you know. Hallelujah. 10,000 atheists couldn't talk you out of it. All right, all right. The devil himself could show up and say there is no God. But you and I are wanting an encounter with God that is so real that nobody. Nobody. I said nobody. Nobody. Not even the devil. Amen. Not even your mother-in-law. Not even. <laughs> you didn't catch that. I know why you didn't. Your mother-in-law sitting behind you. I see that. I, was, I got it. I won't tell nobody. I won't tell her the face that you just made when I said her name. But nobody can talk you out of it. We all want that. Don't you? Don't you want it? Are you here? Are you here? Have you ever prayed that prayer? Lord, I need to know one more time that you're on my side. You ever prayed that prayer? We all want that. But before the upper room, watch this. Verse 9. And after he said this, he was taken up. As they were watching, a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going, they were gazing into heaven. Now think about this. They're standing there walking with Jesus. If we were to put this production together, they're walking with Jesus. They're talking with Jesus. And they say, are you going to restore the kingdom back to this earth? And he says, now, you know what? That's, we're not talking about that right now. But what I am telling you is the Holy Spirit is going to come and you're going to have a, a dynamo of power inside of you that you're not going to be able to be stopped. And you're going to be witnesses at home. And then you're going to be witnesses in the neighborhood. And then you're going to be witnesses. The power is going to follow you even when the enemy shows up in Samaria. You are going to have some power. I mean, something is about to happen in your life. And so they say, oh, that's great. He says, you know, you got to do everything that I said. You got to take a Sabbath day journey. You got to get to that upper room. You've got to get in there and you've got to wait for me. And you have to do that. That's what you have to do. And they're thinking about all of this that's going on. And then the next thing you know, Jesus is taken from them. Now, you and I initially look at this and think about how awesome this is to have walked with Jesus. But I, I want you to put yourself in this place for just a moment before the upper room, before the encounter with God, before the answer to your prayer. Before all that you thought that you were going to get when God makes you what you need to be for your family and for those around. Before all of that happens. Remember, these disciples watch him die on a cross. They watch the man that raised Lazarus from the dead with one word die on a cross. They watched this man that walked on water die on a cross. They watched this man that took a few loaves and fish and multiplied them and fed thousands of people. They watched him die. All right. And for three days, they were destitute. They had no idea what to do. He was gone. He was no longer Superman. He was no longer this masterful master walking through the earth that could speak a word and cause demons to flee. They watched him beaten like a normal man. They watched him with a crown of thorns on his head like a normal man. They watched him bleed and die on a cross. But three days later, on resurrection day when he showed up, 
And he said, I am the resurrection and I'm the life. And if you believe in me, you'll never die. He said, you'll be with me. I came to this earth to show you what you could be if you would let me in your life. And now he's been with them and they're walking together and things are going well and he's ministering to them and he's telling them I'm here. And here's what they think. Here's what they think. We've gotten him back. All right. Yes. Yes. Have you ever been there? Mm-hmm. Have you ever been where you felt like you were away from Jesus, but then you reached a place in your life where you got him back? All right. All right. And you're like, I'm back where I need to be. You know, it's like the breakup. You were with the girl or the guy, and then they break up with you. And now you're sad. I can't even eat. <laughs> What's wrong? She went. But she comes back, and she shows up, and now you're happy again. <laughs> That's how those disciples were with Jesus. They said, we had him. We lost him. He's dead. They killed him. He's never going to. And then he's back again. And he's he's making fish sandwiches on the shore. And they're all, all just, oh, this is great. We're all back together again. And they're all excited. But then, on this day, when he gives them the greatest promise, it is overshadowed by the fact that he leaves them again. Now put yourself in those disciples' place. Oh no, I can't do this again. Lord, we went, we watched you die. I can't do this again. I, I, I can't. I know you gave me this great promise, but Lord, you can't just, how can you do this to us? You're telling us how great it's going to be. And you're telling us how wonderful it's going to be. And you're telling us how awesome it's going to be. And it's all fantastic. But then they blink for just a moment. And he's gone again. And they feel like they are down in the basement once again. The breakup has happened again. The, 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 the depression is back again. I wonder if I'm talking to anybody this morning. Oh, you used to be on fire. You used to be the one that would run through a troop and leap over a wall. You were the one that nobody could stop. You were the one that would be the first one there. You'd be the one that would pick up the battle cry and run and say, nothing will stop me. But now you're facing something that you feel like Jesus has left you again. Let me tell you, if you feel that way. You are right before the upper room. I said you're right before the upper room. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you're closer than you think. Oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Look at this. Look at what happens next in this next verse of scripture. It says that he disappears. And what are they doing? They're looking up into heaven. Because that's all you know to do. You ever live somewhere and you ride by and you stop if you're ever visiting there again and you ride by and stop and look at the neighborhood you just look that's where I grew up it could be a good thing right oh man we used to play volleyball back there you might say that to your siblings remember that's where I beat you up remember that time I pushed you down in the mud and told mom that you fell that was a good time wasn't it? those were great times man why aren't you laughing? It was a great time. <laughs> or it could be a bad experience. That's where I was abused. That's where I had a difficult day. That's where this happened. That's where that happened. That's where the drive-by took place. But all you know to do is look. And that's all they were doing. And right now, we are standing around when we go through difficult times and we go through struggles and we don't know what to do. We're just looking. Lord, where are you? What a song that was sung this morning. I went to the mountain and looked all around. I couldn't find anybody. Yeah. I went down in the valley and looked all around. I couldn't find anybody. Notice that not one verse of that song did my dear brother, as he was over here singing his heart out, never once did he say, I was walking down the street and I found somebody just like you. You know why he didn't sing the verse? Because the verse was never written. You know why the verse was never written? Because there is nobody like him. He is the only one in your life that 
can make a difference. He goes up into heaven. They're standing there looking. Now what? We've lost him again. We're lonely again. We're broken again. Why are we going to pray? Every time we pray, it shows up and leaves. How difficult this is. And before we wag our finger at the disciples and say, well, I don't know what their problem is, we should first stop and wonder what our problem is. They didn't have the completed canonization of Scripture. We have the whole story in its totality. And we look at them and go, well, if I were them, I would have just stood up and believed God no matter what. I would have just stood up and said, no, 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 devil. I'm going to believe God no matter. Hush your mouth. We got a more than they ever had. We have a better covenant, a better faith. And yet, I said, and yet, sometimes we struggle. We're standing where Jesus was, where we knew he was in our life, where we knew he was touching us. And now it seems that he's gone and we stare. But let me tell you what else happens just before the upper room, because look at this. It says in verse number nine, he said this. He was taken up. He's gone. They were watching and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going, they were gazing into heaven. And suddenly, two men in white clothes stood by them. Wonder who these guys were. Were they selling Amway? <laughs> Excuse me, we've been trying to reach you about your car warranty. <laughs> Do you have a moment that we might speak with you? Two men showed up. Notice that. I've heard this preached so many times. The angels floated down. They came out of heaven. That's good. Not what it says, but that's okay, I guess. If that's what you want to say. It says they walked up beside him. Now here's what I think is interesting. I want to know what the first message from heaven was right after Jesus left the earth. Now we have set the stage now. Don't get in a hurry. I promise I won't keep you long. Mm -hmm. I will be brief, mm -hmm. no matter how long it takes me. <laughs> oh, you got that one. You didn't get the one about the mother-in-law, but you got that one. I hope you know we got lunch plans. <laughs> Dr. Packard, you better. What did he say his name was? Picard. Yeah, just something like that. Wasn't he on Star Trek? He do, he do kind of look like it. He do, he do kind of look like it. So they show up, and here's the message that they give them. You ready for this? You ready? This is close to my closing, so you should be ready for this. They look up to heaven. Here comes these two men, and watch what they say. They say, men of Galilee. Let me stop right there. They say men. Let me tell you what the first message from heaven when Jesus left was. And this is the first message to you and I just before we experience our upper room. Are you ready? They walked up and said men. Heaven knows who you are. Hallelujah. I said heaven knows. Hallelujah. I didn't say the pastor knew. Amen. I didn't say the superintendent knew. I didn't say the bishop knew. I didn't say the president knew. What good would any of that do anyway? Well, if the president just if the president knew your name, then what? So what? It wouldn't matter. But heaven. Hallelujah. I said heaven. Heaven. Hallelujah. Somebody who can invade your bedroom at midnight when you're on the floor crying. Heaven knows. I said heaven knows. Hallelujah. Heaven knows who you are. Heaven knows what your mama put you through. All right. Heaven knows what your mama gave you or didn't give you. Heaven knows what the frustration is in your life. Heaven knows what it is that you're facing. Amen. But then I want you to notice the second message. 
Men, we know who you are. Men of Galilee. Now they were not in Galilee. But they had traveled from Galilee to this mount where they were talking to Jesus. You ready for the second message before the upper room? Mm -hmm. All right. Not only does heaven know who you are, mm -hmm. heaven knows where you came from. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. I said heaven knows where you came from. Amen. Heaven knows the journey mm -hmm. that you had to take. Yes. Heaven knows the struggle mm -hmm. that you had to face. Mm -hmm. Heaven knows the breakup that you had to go with to find out what the next step was. Heaven knows the separation that you feel from God right now. Heaven knows the depression that you've gone through. Heaven knows where it was when you were in Galilee and you had to journey your way to meet Jesus at the Mount of Olives. Oh! I want you to understand. Don't you think for one moment, my brother or my sister, don't you think for one moment, my dear friends, that you walk through this earth and somebody's not paying attention to you. If you don't have a father on this earth that's watching over you, you have a father that is seated in heaven that has his eye on you. I heard somebody say his eye is on the sparrow. That little bird. Watch those little birds hop around in the yard. Say, what in the world are they doing? God is watching. He's watching that little bird. He's keeping his eye on what's going on. Could that very well be the reason why, Pastor, that 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 that, that last accident that somebody was in and everybody else was injured and hurt and somehow you avoided it or you got out of it or you walked away with maybe a few injuries but you still walked away with your life intact. Could that be because God knows where you are and brought you through? Oh, everybody in your family died with that disease. So, you know, I guess you better get ready. Yet here you are. And you go to the doctor and say, Doc, they say that everybody else died with it. So am I going to die with it? The doctor said, well, we don't have any traces of it. I wonder why that is. Why, why is that even possible? Could it be? Because you and I are right before the upper room. You know, if something is a lot closer than you think it is, you will tend to keep going That's for right. it. You know, I, I, I've done work before and, 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 and say you were going to clean a room. Let's say this stage was a room and it was just packed full of just, well, junk. Junk. We just got all kind of stuff in here. Broken toys, broken stuff, broken here, broken there. And this, and you open up the door and look in this, this size room and just see it all the way to the top full of stuff. And the first thing you think is, why in the world did I take this job? <laughs> Especially if you volunteer. You start thinking, you know what, they're getting the better end of the deal. Or then if they said, we'll pay, we'll pay you $20, you start thinking, man, that, this is more than $20. Yes. And you start. And you ever notice, when you get about halfway done with the job, you would think, you say, well, we're about halfway done. But that's not the way it works, does it? You get about halfway done and still see the rest of it and go, Lord, this stuff is multiplied. Where did all this junk come from? Whose junk is this? Then you pick up something that looks like yours. You're like, mm, I, don't, I guess I'm responsible for this. But, you get to the very end and you think to yourself, you know what? Whew, oh man, I'm tired. Whew. Man, I'm dirty from carrying all this stuff out. Man, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm frustrated. I, I really could use a nap. I'm going to get out of here and take a shower and get out of here. And then, somebody that hasn't been in there all day, you've been staring at it all day long, but somebody else walks in and they look at it with fresh eyes and fresh perspective and say, well, you know what? You only got just that last little row. If you knock that out, you don't even have to come back to this place. 
See, that's what I'm doing here today. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you. Hallelujah. I'm God's little GPS Lord today. Jesus. I'm here to tell you that you're looking at the map going, oh no, man, we're so far away. But I'm God's GPS today. Hallelujah. I interrupted your regularly scheduled life and your regularly scheduled service right. to come busting up in here with a special announcement that you are closer to your upper room than what you think you really are. You don't have it just a little bit left. You thought Jesus is gone. I came to tell you. He knows you. And he knows where you are. And he knows what you've been through. And he sent me here today to tell you. You are closer to your upper room than what you think you are. Now here's the only thing that's left that I can tell you. And then I'll be finished. He says, men of Galilee, why are you looking up in heaven? Because that's all we got. That's, we don't have anything else. And then the angel reminds them, or these messengers remind them, says, uh, this same Jesus, he's coming back. But let's not forget, because we all get into, yeah, he's coming back. He go, oh, what a glorious day. I'll fly away, oh, glory. That, that, but, yeah, that part, yes. But don't forget the upper room. All right, all right, all right. Hallelujah. Because the Holy Spirit, Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the... Holy Spirit. Yeah, God the Holy Spirit Amen. is coming yes. in the upper room. Hallelujah. Not many days from now. Hallelujah. So what I really need you to do is he says, you, you got to understand in verse number 12. And then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. What if I could tell you? Hallelujah. Jesus. I'm, I'm going to get past Gavin's move here. <laughs> What if I could tell you? What if I could tell you? What if I could tell you? You're only one day away. Hallelujah. Now, let's summarize all this. The disciples are on, the, uh, on that mount. Jesus is taken into heaven. They feel like they've lost him again. They've fallen down to the bottom. They feel like that they're at the bottom. They're all depressed. They're all ready to give up. The two men walk up and say, wait a minute, why are you looking up into heaven? We want you to know that heaven knows who you are. Right. Heaven knows where you traveled to get here. Right. Heaven knows exactly what's going on. Yeah. So now what you need to do is pick up all your little bit of faith you got left. Pick it all up. Get it all up. And walk a Sabbath day's journey and get to that upper room. Yes. And they could have stood there on that mountain and said, nope, I'm not going. All right, all right. I'm too tired. Nope. I'm too upset. Nope. God let me down again. Nope. I'm going to stand right here on this mountain. And I'm not going anywhere. What if they looked at Peter and Peter had said, I'm done with this. Uh-uh. He died, came back. I appreciate that. But now he's gone again. Uh -uh, I'm not doing this. And had Peter done that, right. he would not have been present oh. in the upper room. Jesus. He would not have been standing there Jesus. when the cloven tongues like fire Hallelujah. sat on him. He would not have been there when the rushing mighty wind came. But even more than that, he would not have been there to be the mouthpiece, to preach the gospel, yeah. to see the birthing yeah. of the New Testament yeah. church in Acts chapter 2. Jesus. What I'm telling you is, what I'm telling you is, I know you feel like you can't do it. But you are so close to your upper room. I feel it. I know it. 
I would stake my 40 years of minute. I've been preaching for 40 years. I've stood in front of congregation for 40 years. I've preached to the masses of thousands. I've preached to a room of two. I've preached all over the world. I've been everywhere you, you could think about. I've been there. Any type of situation, I stood in it. From a living room, to a hospital room, to a chapel, to a church, to Calvary. Now, I've been to Calvary. I've been to Calvary. I made it to Calvary. Somebody say, good. I knew he was going to get saved eventually. 40 years. And I would stake my ministry on this. That I'm here today to tell you. That what's going on right now in your life, it's not an ending. It's just before the upper room. Say it with me. Say just before the upper room. One more time. Say just before the upper room. Now personalize it. Say I am just before my upper room. Do you believe it? I 